All right, man. So let's start out first for folks that don't know you and um, or maybe they do know you, but they don't know your origin story, so to speak. Um, would you mind telling us a little bit about your background and how uh, those things, how you grew up and where you grew up in those things, how those informed your thoughts on violence? Sure. Yeah, I talk about that in the first part of the book, in particular in the first chapter. I go into a little bit of history there because I think it helps explain my point of view as it relates to the entire topic of violence to begin with. But I was born in a very small town in California called Hollister, which is tiny, 20,000 something less people, I think. Uh, really was only famous for one thing, which was back in the beginning of the 20th century, the Hells Angels took it over briefly, and they made a movie about it called The Wild Bunch with Marlon Brando. And um, actually, they came back and attempted to take it over again, along with a very, an even smaller little Spanish mission town called San Juan Batista, which is 15 minutes away. And it didn't work. And I tell the story about why it didn't work later on in the book, because there was a Korean veteran sheriff that was in San Juan Batista that kind of put his foot down there and said, this is not going to happen in my town. And they drove off. But so I was born there, uh, only child, really. My brother wasn't born until I'd already moved out of the house when I was uh, 16. And my dad's a cop, was a cop, retired cop, and uh, non-religious. I would call him agnostic. And my mother was a dedicated Jehovah's Witness. My whole mother's side of the family were Jehovah's Witnesses. And so I kind of dragged along into the world of Jehovah's Witnesses for the first 11 or 12 years until I just stopped going, you know, was able to stop going. And there's a bit of a contradiction there because they're basically pacifists. So they have a they have an attitude about um, you you can't join the military, you can't be a police officer, you can't you can't carry a gun, you can't do anything where you might put yourself in a situation where you might hurt another person. And um, that always created a a conflict for me because on one hand I have my dad who I loved and admired and I saw him and and I grew up around him and the other police officers at the police station and saw what they did and viewed them as the good guys. And then on the other hand, I had what I was being told in the church. And when I would ask my father about it, he would always give me the nicest possible answer skewed towards my mom's point of view, which was basically, well, if everybody believed like your mom, then we wouldn't, I wouldn't need to be a cop, which is true. But also, like I say in the book, that's kind of like saying, well, if, if there was no such thing as disease, then we wouldn't need to have doctors. It's, it's equally true as it is irrelevant. Um, and so that's kind of my background. And then when I went into school, we moved as a teenager and I moved to a much bigger area in, uh, northern north of San Francisco in the Bay Area and a uh, much bigger school, had some run ins, became got bullied a little bit and then kind of overnight flipped and turned into a violent delinquent, which is easy to do at that age. Um and that solved the getting bullied problem for me, but it didn't really solve, it wasn't really the solution, long-term solution for dealing with violence. And that set me off, I, I think, in a way, into the world of martial arts. I think it helped contribute to my fascination with martial arts and also just because I was just always fascinated by them. And, and like I said in the book, my main fascination has always been what works and what doesn't. To this day, that's what interests me. To this day, what interests me about jujitsu is the jujitsu that works in a fight. <clears throat> I don't know exactly why, but that's been kind of my overwhelming interest and desire in this whole thing for the last 40 years. And that guided my journey to where we are now with SBG and makes martial arts and, and Brazilian jujitsu. Um, and that, the story of that is kind of part, part of what the book is about. Yeah. I thought it was really interesting to read. The part about being bullied, I know we've talked about it before, but a lot of folks would probably find that just a preposterous thing that a guy who's six foot 17 or however tall you are, <laughs> um, a, a Nephilim, how, yeah. would find, find that hard to believe that you had ever experienced a time where you were concerned about your safety yeah. and and had lived with the, kind of the, I know trauma is a word we use a lot, but um, I think it applies here because it also affected that other side of you where you became kind of the violent delinquent side of it, which would be the pendulum swinging back, right? Like yeah. I once was yeah. the victim. 
now I'm going to be the victimizer. Yeah. And it, I think that's really important for, as we get further into the book, it's really important because it, I can see how that influences your views on violence and kind of, I think in a good way, kept you from going down the path of where a lot of self-defense books go, which is you talk about the false bravado and the delusion and all that kind of stuff. I think it was really yeah. cool. You know, I mean, not that it's cool that you went through that, but I think how it turned out for you was beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. The thing to remember is, so I, I left school or I left home at 15. I went to college for a little bit. I took the proficiency exam to get my high school diploma and went to college for a short bit. And then when I turned 18, I went into the military. And just to give you an idea, when I was in the military, I was the same height I am now. So I think I was six foot eight. And uh, I don't think I ever busted 130 pounds. So I was super skinny, right? I was like, I was oh, literally, literally 110 pounds lighter than I am right now. And I'm walking pretty thin right now. So, so I was a uh, uh, super skinny, very tall target at when I was a kid. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So that, I hope that helps folks kind of understand where you're coming from. You're not just this big guy who's never had a problem. Never. You, this is completely an intellectual exercise for you. This is something you've lived and dealt with and then has driven your path through the martial arts. I think also explains a lot of why your focus in the martial arts has always been on what's effective and what what's fight effective, you right. know, what's going to, what's going to work if I actually have to protect myself or my loved ones. So um, there's a lot. One of the things I liked about the books, there's 73 or 74 pages of notes yeah, and just an enormous amount of citation. I think that's really cool. Um, why why was that important for you in a book on self-defense? Why was it so important to have notes and citations? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's It was important for me for the same reason that the second chapter in a book is called Truth, and it's basically just a, a walk through the epistemology that I use to arrive at my conclusions, because I want people to be able to follow my logic. On one hand, the book tells a story, because nonfiction is very hard to write without a story because there's no plot. So you need some kind of narrative to carry to carry the the information along. But on the other hand, it's also an argument. The book is one long argument for why we do what we do now and how we came to that conclusion. And I don't want to just say this is how you should do it. I want people to be able to follow the logic and see how I arrived at my conclusion. Because I think understanding how I, how we, everybody in the organization has arrived where we are is more important than just where we are because then they can follow the same thing. So I track them through the second chapter of the kind of the scientific process, the epistemology of how we arrive at that. And, and everything in the book is based on facts and evidence. And, and that was super important to me. So every single piece of uh, objective fact that you'll find in there is footnoted with at least three citations and, and often more and we wound up with so many that I was afraid, you know, I was actually, I had a very generous publisher to be able to give me that much space, th that many pages for a first time author and to, to be able to put that much effort. And he was a huge help as well with the citations. Um, yeah. And it's, it's probably 25% like of the book is, is citations. And it also yeah, provides an extra roadmap for people. If people want to take, if they go dive into any one particular area of the book, and want to take it farther, they can use those citations to go back to some of the original sources. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. It kind of gives you a roadmap to not only understand what's being written now, but also go find the sources for those yeah. things and kind of see where it came from. Um, I thought also that in going through the book, reading through the book, I felt like this was just a, a longer version of an, a a class at SBG, like your master class on Friday night. Like this is exactly how you help people come to an understanding. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something I've always liked about your coaching and admired about your coaching is that you never really tell somebody do A, B, or C. Right. You are, you give, give them suggestions and kind of put them on the path to finding it for themselves, yeah. which is probably more important. Yeah. I think at this Absolutely. point now, looking back, um, it's more important for the student to discover it for themselves. Mm -hmm. And then kind of plot, you know, it's almost like the the five whys. You ask why, and then ask why, and then ask why, and eventually you get to the source yeah. of what's really going on. Yeah, you boil and, it down. 
Yeah. In the same note, um, with all the citations, all the notes that were in there, what was cut out? What was eliminated? Oh, man. So I wrote five times as much as is in that book. And then <laughs> even even after editing, there was five times as much as, as was in that book. And so it was just too big. When I, when I set out to write the book, I, I actually intentionally set out um, – to write the book about violence. I'm I want, this is it. There's going to be one book that I could give someone and give someone I love someone I care about to keep them safe, to explain how we do what we do, to get rid of the street versus sport argument once and for all. The kind of like just the final answer to these things that you and I and the other SBG coaches have been repeating and saying and having these zombie arguments that we've been having now for yeah. like two decades. Right. Right. So I wanted to have that in there. And so I wound up writing everything. And there was a lot of con contributions as well from other SBG coaches, from yourself, from Adam, from other, Steve, from other people. Um, and a lot of that got taken out because it was just too big. So and I think yeah. I think it it was correct because the book is good the way it is, but it it leaves room for two other books. So there's two kind of other aspects that got taken out. One is all of the physical technical training. So the stand up there was chapters on stand up clinch ground and weapons. Those mm -hmm. got taken out. And so that'll be a separate book. Um that would include pictures and diagrams and things like that. And then there was several chapters related to that about coaching, how to coach yeah. and yeah. how how to drill and all that kind of stuff and and now all that got taken out as well. So I think um there are two more books in there. One um the actual physical techniques of violence the, the the physical gift of violence and then two the art of coaching violence that uh that i can do in the future just from what i've already written but that's what that's what got deleted out of the book just for it would have been, it would be four times the size if oh, i hadn't yeah. done that yeah that's pretty cool though it's just a lifetime of work so so people can look forward to the next two volumes coming out and you're going to do audio on those too right I am. We just finished actually today. I just finished the audio book for this one. I hope we'll see how this one sells. So I've got, I've got to get my publisher to agree to go for the others if he wants, but if the, if it sells well and he wants to do it, then, um, then I will definitely do it. It is a lot of work. It yeah. took me 10 years to write this book and, and writing a book is the, but probably the hardest work thing that I've ever done. Yeah. Um, but I would like to get all that information out there. So yeah, ultimately, hopefully we can get those other two books out there. Yeah. And do you think that we're ever going to reach a point where like, say with books like this, like the gift of violence out there and the conversations, you, as you mentioned, we've been having for as long as it, it feels like, as long as there's been internet forums or the chat rooms and things, you think there's ever going to be a time where the martial arts woo, you know, the one fingered, knockout or whatever they're called you you think there's ever going to be a time where that's just not going to be around no i think it'll always be around and I, I talk about that a little bit in the book too especially in the chapter on truth but and this this is a question i get asked all the time i'm sure you get asked all the time you know if 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 this stuff is such bullshit or clearly this stuff is such bullshit why does it persist over and over again and there's multiple reasons for it but from the evolutionary perspective i what i try and remind people is things persist in evolution not because they're necessarily good for us or they're good for the organism but because they're they're it they're good at replication so anything that's good at replication will persist from generation to generation even if it's pernicious like a virus and there are things in traditional martial arts just like there are things in religions and things in cults and things in um fake alternative medicine and, and all, all, all manner of woo woo for lack of a better term that make them good at replication, which is why con artists and other people grab onto it because it, it gives them a hook. So that's one thing. So as long as it, it's good at replication, it's always going to be there. And the example I give in the book and that I usually bring up to people is just astrology. I mean, we've had astronomy now for several hundred years and we've had <laughs> Galileo and Copernicus and we have, all this amazing information and anybody that's interested in the universe and how many stars there are, like just the flat out basic science of our universe is beyond amazing. And yet people still turn to astrology in almost every newspaper around the world. And, yeah. and that's been going on for thousands of years. And I, and I'm sure that when my grandkids 
are older, astrology will still exist. So, so that's part of it. And then part of it too, and this goes back to the people that we've argued with and, and the different communities in the JKD community in particular and places like that. It's what people want. People, yeah. people want a magic bullet. You know, I was thinking about this the other day when I, a couple of years ago, I wrote an article about Sistema. And it it was at the time, I don't know if it still is, but at the time it was the newest fad art for the JKD people. So Dan and Asano was training with a guy named Martin Wheeler down there in Los Angeles. And and um, and so everybody was jumping on that bandwagon as it, as the new sea lot or the new super deadly martial art. And these are people who many times have black belts in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. They've done boxing, they've done kickboxing, they've done Muay Thai. They've seen functional martial arts. And then you'll see something as, and there's no nice way to put it, being ridiculous is Sistema. Sistema is about as silly as you can get. It, it'd be right. difficult for me to make up something dumber. I mean, right. you and I would have to try hard to make something <laughs> stupid. And, and yet, they jump on it. And then I started to think about it, and I realized that this is my working hypothesis right now anyway. Part of why they like it is because it's so very different from anything that's functional. And so, mm. you know, if it looked like boxing or it looked like kickboxing or it looked like wrestling, it would be it would be part of what everybody else knows and what everybody else does. And what they want is they want a magic bullet. They want a secret right. martial art that nobody else has seen that looks different from anything else that comes in and brings some sort of secret technology that they can then use. And that's sort of like the underlying motivation for it. And so... Con artists will come around and exploit that, and they'll come up with something that looks really stupid and really weird and really different from anything else before. But in a way, that kind of becomes the hook because it doesn't look yeah. like boxing. It doesn't look like wrestling. And that's what those people jump on. And so part of that is, is that it's good at replication, and part of it is that there's an audience for it. People want yeah. that. And as long as people want that, there's going to be somebody who's going to pop up to sell it to them. Yeah. I think, and I'll, I'm curious your thoughts on this. Sometimes I think it's some sort of almost um, dysfunctional optimism yep. where they're really wishing that there is something that will work other than just doing the work. Yeah. Um, you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Judo, Boxing, Muay Thai, it's all, it all has a grind of its own. It's all hard work. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to me to see somebody who has a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu then go pursue a black belt in Aikido or mm -hmm. Sistema or whatever. And, and I'm, I'm always curious about that. And when I talk to them, it's, I, it always comes back to, well, there might be something out there. I don't know about, mm -hmm. there might be an answer that I haven't found yet. And so I feel like it's some sort of weird optimism that there's something out there that's going to make it so much easier. But then the other side of it too, I think is sometimes it's, it's that that part of our nature that wants to put things in a box. Yep. Like I've accomplished this, we're done. Let me move to the next thing. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's almost, you know, in law enforcement, they call them, you know, certificate collectors. Yep. Guys that go to school after school after school, but yep. they never become really accomplished instructors or, you know, officers or whatever, because they never really learn how to apply what matters. You know, they get they get really good at a lot of stuff, but they never get great at anything. Yeah. No, that's definitely true. I think that's a big part of it. And also, I think it goes back to why, I, that's why I think epistemology is so important. You know, I think mm -hmm. sometimes the people who say that, not always, but some of the people who say, you know, I'm going to go back to Aikido because I think I might find something functional in Aikido or whatever it is. They might have a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but that doesn't mean they understand why Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu works. That doesn't mean they understand why they got to the skill level they did, they may not understand the process. They may not understand how the whole thing works. And so to them, it's just, well, that's just more technique. We just need to get more. Here's a different kind of technique. So we'll use this technique, but they don't understand the aliveness aspect of it. And if they don't understand that, you could easily get led astray and go from, you know, just, just every shiny object in the world might look like something good to you. And if you don't, if you don't understand that epistemology, how would you know without trying it? So then they'll, they'll jump in and they'll start to take those kind of classes. And to me, that goes back to why it's important to explain to people, not just what works, but how we discovered what works 
how we know what works and how to test what works. So that's, I think it, I would be very surprised if someone who truly understands the, the operating mechanism behind learning a functional martial art, the actual aliveness aspect of it, the epistemology of it, then goes on to try and test these other systems. I think without exception, I think you would find it. I could be wrong, but I would think you would find when you talk to them that they, they don't quite get it. They don't get yeah. that aliveness part of it yet. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that kind of brings us into talking about the importance of uh, being honest about the problem, whether it's violence in society, um, the ability to defend ourselves using the martial arts that we choose, um, and as well as our ability to respond to the problem. We have to be honest with ourselves. Like, what are my capabilities? What are your thoughts on that? And how, how do we encourage people to be honest with the problem? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I think we have to be, I think we have to be willing to have public conversations about difficult topics. Everybody in the world, by the way, says, oh, it's, we all need, we all, we need to have difficult conversations. Everybody says that. But 99% of the time, the people who are talking about difficult conversations don't really want to have a difficult conversation. What they want you to do is agree with their point of view. Right. A difficult conversation is when you're having a conversation with somebody who you don't agree with. And you want to truly understand their argument and go back and forth on it and, and address that. Um, and through that, you know, through that uh, dialectic, learn and grow and maybe change your own opinion. And that that's not what's happening now, I think, in the public in the public domain. I mean, mm -hmm. it is, but it's happening in alternative media. And our media right. landscape as a whole is, is a kind of a, a unibody of kind of one thought especially when it comes to violence, yeah, which is super dangerous. And so, you know, there's no way I, I could have written this book and not talked about race. There's no way you can write a book about violence in America and not talk about the massive discrepancies that exist, the differences that exist between different racial groups when it comes to being both a victim and a perpetrator of violent crime. There's just no way you can do it because – Anybody who goes and looks at the raw data, which is what I did when I went to start to write the book, is that's the, one of the first things that's going to jump out at you. The first thing that's going to jump out at you is, is that it's almost all male. And then the right. second thing that's going to jump out at you is the age, like 15 to 32 with like the 19 to 22 bracket being the huge one. And then it starts to drop off. And right. then the third thing that's going to jump out at you is the 50% or more of it occurs from a small demographic, which is um, African-American community in the United States, and which, by the way, are also the majority of the victims. And if we don't talk about that and we don't talk about the reasons for that, then we can't actually realistically talk about violent crime in America, and we definitely can't find a solution to it. So, you know, my book's not a public policy book, but I do talk about those issues. And I talk about that data because I think people need to be informed about that. They need to understand that and actually know, you know, where it's okay to go and where, where it's not okay to go. And, um, and I hope that it leads to more conversations about public policy. And I kind of point in a couple of particular directions about public policy in the book, but that would be an example. And, and the only other thing I would say about that is if you're going to do that, you have to be very careful about how you do it. And you have to make sure that everything you're doing is based in the data, which is one of the other reasons why the book is so, there's so many citations and heavily cited. So I, you know, I tell people when I start to put, throw the data out there and they see the charts and they see the numbers, all the all of that's cited in the book. And I want people to go back and look at the data, the sources themselves. You can go to the Bureau of Justice and Statistics and to the FBI and with homicides, to CDC, and you can, you can look at the Washington Post database on shootings if you want to go to the Washington Post as well. And you can take all that information and you can combine it and you can get a really good handle on who's killing who, where, and and when, and how, and how, and why. And it's not going to be what I think most people think it is. And it's definitely not going to be what the media tells you it is. And so people have to be willing to, to, um, to do that, to look. I've been surprised surprise pleasantly surprised i guess to to date i've done a, a lot of podcasts a few big ones and i was anticipating in the in the climate post george floyd um summer of 2020 
I was anticipating having a lot more problems having these conversations with people than I've had. And so far, everybody's been receptive to it. And inter- even people who are from the political left who completely disagree with me have been open and receptive to the way I made the argument, which I'd, which I'm happy about. So, so far, I haven't been canceled. <laughs> so far. Today. Yeah, yeah. Today. Work this date, date and time. But yeah, I think part of the part of the challenge is to have those conversations about difficult subjects and and how we frame them. And then also being being willing to, and I'm interested in your thoughts on this. I look at it almost like a drilling session mm-hmm. from jujitsu or or any of the fight sports where I say, listen, I want to, I need to work on my ability to throw a jab use the jab as a more offensive tool. My jab is lacking. And so we start with jab versus jab, then my jab versus third jab cross, and then my jab versus third jab cross leg kick. And Mm -hmm. eventually I get to a point where I can use my jab as an offensive tool to establish distance and keep them there. However, if within the first few rounds, I start throwing everything I've got back at them, now we're just fighting. Mm-hmm. And so we have to have those parameters in place, those constraints, and we both have to agree that this is what we're going to talk about. And we're not going to go off the rails. We're not going to go into the weeds and we're going to stick to data and facts. Mm-hmm. And do you think that's a good approach? Do you think that mm-hmm. would help a lot with these conversations where we could actually talk about difficult conversations and not get lost in the, even though we might feel the emotion, just like in sparring yeah. or drilling, I would feel the emotion and want to, but I have to constrain myself and stick with what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah. No, I think that's a great approach. I actually think that's the only approach. Um, and I think that's the approach people naturally take as long as both parties are arguing or conversing in good faith. I think where mm-hmm. we wind up, where, where we have problems is when one, one part of the one party isn't operating a good faith, in which case they're going to intentionally misconstrue what you're saying or intentionally misstate what you're saying. They're not going to steel man your argument. They're going to ignore the data and they're going to jump right past it. And then you get into ad hominems and and that kind of stuff, which is what it often devolves into. And, and you know, those are just people that there's no point talking to them about people like that, but talking to people like that. But where it becomes interesting is when both parties are operating in really good faith and want to have an honest conversation about that. And this is, you know, like we talked about every day, there's like what, 20, 22, 23 people murdered in Chicago and then Baltimore and St. Louis, like every single weekend, there's two dozen people being murdered and drive by some of them kids every single weekend. There's five or 6,000 homicides like that a year in this country. And there's been about 3,000 more than there used to be, thanks to the BLM movement and the George Floyd, uh, the, all, all the quote unquote reforms that were put in place post George Floyd, all of which has made everything worse. And so what we're talking about an issue too, it's important for people to understand the consequences of what we're talking about is human life. Mm-hmm. Getting this wrong means hundreds and ultimately thousands more people might die. And right. so it's an important conversation to have. It's not a conversation that's being had very often in the in the media landscape. There's only a there's only a few people that are willing to talk about it. Um, you know, and uh and yeah, I I think that's the only way you can do it. You have to be able to 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 stick to the subject and to stick to the data and the evidence. Right. How do you think well we could educate children on this subject is the, the the entire subject of violence and i know there's other books out there that talk about how to teach our kids and trusting your intuition and all those things and that's important mm-hmm. but i also want to hear your thoughts on how do we do a children's version of the gift of violence how would we talk about this with our kids yeah well i have i have some chapters in in the book about that i'm a father of soon to be six <laughs> and uh <laughs> Uh, so I, t- I talk a little bit about it and I, and I offer some advice, um, another good book, not to, pl- I should be plugging my own book, but you know, uh, Gavin DeBecker's book, protecting the gift, I thought was a great book. So I, every parent I think should read that book. Is, and if they read that book and they read my book, I think they would have a really good handle on, on, um, what to do mm-hmm. but with the kids. The main thing I talk about is number one, there has to be 
an awareness of, between you and the child about what's going on in that child's life and and what that child is being exposed to and a trust between you and the child and communication and all that kind of stuff. And if that's absent, then there's going to be problems. And you and I both know that the predators that, you know, go after these kids or looking for kids that don't have those kind of close relationships with their, with the parents and the people that take care of them. And those are the ones that are going to get targeted. So that's the beginning of it, making sure you maintain that trust and awareness. And in that involves having honest conversations as well with kids about what to do and what not to do and learning how to talk to people and, and what should they do if they get lost and what should they do if someone's asking them particular questions and kind of acting it out and talking to the kids about that. And then next I talk about boundaries, like kids need to be taught and explained what healthy boundaries are, what's okay, what's not okay, where somebody else can touch them or not touch them and that nobody has a right to touch them if they don't want to. And backing up the child, I tell a story in the book about my daughter, but uh, where I was giving a talk one time in Portland and my, my wife Salome and my older daughter Annika were in the audience and she was probably eight or nine at the time. And a guy next to her, next to Annika, put his hand on her shoulder and she kind of shrugged it off and she didn't like that. And I could see from my vantage point, given the talk, and it seemed fairly innocuous to me. So I didn't, you know, it didn't seem malicious, but my wife then put her arm around Annika and kind of, you know, completely supported her in the moment, which kind of made the guy pull back a little bit and then everything was fine. Yeah. But after thinking about it at the end of the talk, I realized I was really happy with how that played out. I was happy with my daughter's reaction, and I was especially happy with my wife's reaction because had my wife reacted in a different way, perhaps you know, chastising Annika for that, then she could have learned a terrible lesson that day, which is, hey, you, you got to let people put their hands on you if, if they want to, which yeah. is exactly the opposite of what we want. And once once they have that awareness and the understanding of those boundaries and what those boundaries are, then I think all that's left to teach kids is how to deal with confrontation physically, yes. verbally, you know, and that's something you can you can teach kids to be good at confrontation and not to be afraid of confrontation. And, and that'll help them deal with bullies, uh, both the kind of female version of bullying, which is more like uh, social relationships and fear of isolation and nobody's going to be friends with you if you don't do what I want. And the male boy version of bullying, which is actual physical violence and restraining and, and hitting people. Being able to deal with that with their own age, as well as being able to deal with adult predators. Yeah, for sure. Um, so a couple of the questions that we got from folks who were in the social media, uh, they, they had some questions out there. So one of them, I think this is from Brian Walsh. Oh, Brian. Um, okay. Yeah, he said that you talk about in Chapter 15, pages 168 through 173, you cover the parameters for recognizing threats on a continuum. Um, how could one use this as a framework to create drills or exercises to recognize bad actors, ideally on a, on a range from toxic, threatening, to treacherous? Hmm. That's a good question. I'm tempted to grab my book and look up those, those pages because <laughs> I don't remember off the top of the head, off the top of my head, what he's talking about. But um, so in the book, we talk about pre-incident indicators and we talk about um, things that people will do and how to identify. Let me let me take a step back real quick. When I was reading all the literature on self-defense, the vast majority of what I would come across dealt with strangers. And, and I, I think that's fine, and I understand why that is. And there's various reasons why I think that happens. And I also understand why, for a lot of people, that becomes their biggest concern and fear because they feel like they've patrolled the boundaries of their life pretty well. And like the Pettit family, which I'm, I use in, in my book, they may, they may not fit the, arc, the classic structure of somebody who, who's going to be involved in those kind of encounters. The, the, Mr. Pettit was a doctor. They lived in a nice neighborhood. They had the girls weren't going out with drug addicts. Nobody in the family was in jail. Like they didn't fit that category of, and so for that family to be primarily concerned with people outside their doors and strangers, I totally get it. But the mm -hmm. other thing that I, I thought was really important for people to understand is that again, when you go back to the data statistically across the board, 
whenever anybody's attacked by any kind of violent crime, rape or assault or homicide or even burglary, it's almost always somebody you know. Mm -hmm. It's almost always somebody you know. Um, and so I wanted to also talk about the people in your life that might be those kind of predators and being able to recognize those. And I thought that was a little bit different because I hadn't really read that or seen that anywhere else um, discussed. And I think that's important because I think just like the violent criminal actors will give you certain indications of who and what they are and what they're after on the street before it ever becomes physical, the people in your life who are going to be looking to exploit and manipulate and take advantage and do negative things, yeah. ultimately culminating at potentially in physical violence, do the same thing. They, yes. they, they give you, they, they give off these certain traits. So I wanted to list those traits. And I intentionally call them, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not trying to, you know, use the DSM or describe anybody or identify anybody as a sociopath or anything like that, which is also the reason why I intentionally use the trait, the point um, term, character disorder because i do think it's important for people to realize whatever problems these people have whatever reasons they have for behaving the way they do and we all have our reasons for behaving the way we do all of us do we live in a deterministic world um repeated error is still a character flaw you yep. know if, if you repeat the error over and over again it's a character <laughs> flaw and it's an indication of what <laughs> what this person's in, true intentions are so there's that there's that aspect of it, which is, you know, we'll call the people, you know, the character disordered. And then there's the violent criminal actors. And with the violent criminal actors, we have the pre-incident indicators and the things that that they'll do leading up to, you know, mugging or robbing or assaulting or attacking. And as far as drilling those, I mean, that's something that you've done good in your self-defense classes that you've taught here in Portland. You know, when we teach people how to talk, tell, make. And have those yeah. and to be able to engage and it goes back to from what i've seen and and what what i've done of that over the last few years it almost always goes back again to people being aware and then being comfortable with confrontation so being comfortable mm -hmm. telling people no uh understanding when they should tell people no and yeah you can drill that just like you can drill throwing across or escaping a headlock and um you know I, i've done a couple self-defense workshops that have been just a day or two. And when I do those, I did one for a building downtown a couple months ago that was mostly elderly people. You know, I'm not going to be teaching anything physical. I showed them a, a, a couple grip breaks, but the majority of what I did was just talk and explain to them the information I'm laying out here. And then we did one drill and the drill we did was telling people, talk till make telling people no stop yeah. you know fucking stop and raising your voice right. and holding your hands up and maintaining distance and moving and and they loved it and yeah. there was a few of them that had a hard time doing it um because it, it didn't come natural for them to to engage that way and they loved it even more and i think in the confines of that kind of drill you could put in all of those um indicate indicators and and use those as cues uh, to create drills to help people learn how to maintain distance from that stuff. Yeah, I think it's similar in it to what Joe Rogan said about white belts and blue belts are there for you to beat up and get really good at jujitsu. Yeah, and I know it's kind of like butchering his quote a little bit. And, yeah, uh, you know we joke around about it, but that is there is some truth to that. Where it's how you get your offense. Safety. Yeah, there's some safety with white belts and blue belts and it gives you the opportunity to work on your attacks and all that good stuff. Yeah. And I think, you know, you touched on it a little bit in when you were beginning to answer the question where you, you talked about it's somebody known to you, family members, and this is your opportunity to become comfortable with confrontation yeah. where you yeah. finally take that space back, that mental ground back where you tell that family member, I'm not cool with how you're treating me and I'm not going to put up with it any, any longer. You know, I will draw some hard boundaries here. And if it means I don't come around you or you don't come around me or my kids or whatever the case may be, I think that gives folks the opportunity to exercise that muscle of confrontation and stand in their ground so that if they ever have to against someone who's truly dangerous uh, to them, they'll be more comfortable with it. You know, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, that's exactly right. And you talked about this before, too, and I, I actually mention this and write about this in the book, but learning how to talk to people, 
Like yeah. um, your job is a, everybody I've seen who's been a good police officer is by definition, they're good at talking to people. That's part yeah. of, that's a big part of what you do. Yeah, every it's day. Part of the job. But not, um, not everybody does that. Not everybody, you know, a lot of people might work in an office or have very limited social interactions. And so then they can get caught off guard when they're, you know, walking down the street and they get accosted by maybe an, an aggressive homeless panhandler or who knows what, and they're uncomfortable with that kind of confrontation. So, learning how to talk to strangers and be comfortable with that kind of banter and that back and forth, all of that helps you make it easier for you when it comes time to defend your boundaries and, and be able to deal with that confrontation. I even talk about it as well in terms of the MMA fight teams and how Carl would use that. And, uh, and Conley does the same thing with where there's fighters will banter back and forth during practice but there's a reason behind it. And it's, it's almost, it's part of the sport and part of the art and part of being able to think quickly on your feet and part of being able to maintain your boundaries. And it's part of confrontation mm -hmm. and, um, and, and the, it's a skill just like yeah. being able to do jujitsu or anything else that you can practice. And, and a great way to practice it, as you said many times before, is to, is in your daily interactions, talking in a nice way, you know, to, yeah. talking to the person that makes your coffee or whoever at the gas station or whatever, just being able to engage with them. And I know that's, I know from teaching how many people have terrible social anxiety. Because, yeah. you know, we run into it all the time as coaches here in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, where it's like super hard for people sometimes just to come to class because they're so so much of that. I've never been burdened with that particular problem, but I've seen so many people have it. I know it's so common. And, and to me, I think the answer to that is more exposure, like doing it more and more and more and more. And I know, even though it's uncomfortable in your daily life, um, just like, you know, you can train it and you can get better at it. Yeah, for sure. I think Mark Twight, um, the trainer, the, um, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Mark. He owned uh, Jim Jones for a while. And so uh, he has a, a term for it. He calls them cubicle bodies. And what that is, is somebody who, because of the lack of emphasis on physical education in our schools now, and you can opt out of gym class and all that stuff, you have people who go from a desk in school to a desk in college to a desk at work. And they never, so then you have these folks come into the gym. They realize, hey, a lot of my aches and pains could be cured by exercise mm -hmm. and they come into the gym and they can't figure out how to do simple things like just jump, you know, things we did as children, but they just, it's yeah. gone. They're, they yeah. become a cubicle body. And I wonder if it's possible that to some degree we, we develop cubicle minds, mm -hmm. you know, where we've lost the ability to interact with another human being and the, the, just the thought. And, and like you said, we see it with people who have just so much anxiety about coming on the mat with a large group of people. And it's like, well, everybody here is on the same page. Everybody here is doing the same thing. And they might even be feeling the same as you. And they also want the best for you. They want you to keep coming and they want you to be good at jujitsu and, and have fun with this and just trying to have that conversation. And it's interesting now that I think about it in that context, maybe it is that we spend so much of our day isolated yeah. And not having contact with others that it makes it difficult when it's time, you know, that moment where everything's at, you know, the stakes are high. It's probably not the best time to start practicing your ability to talk. You right. know? <laughs> it's probably, probably, probably should have yeah. thought about that. No, I think but, that makes absolute sense. And, you know, I don't I don't. I haven't seen any studies on it or anything like that, but just, it's just logical that if you isolate people away from other, it, being able to socialize and interact with other human beings is a skill set like any other that could be get better or, or become lost. I think it's important too, with that, like the key is exposure and exposure, meaning you have to be able to put yourself in a vulnerable position and you're not going to put yourself in a vulnerable position. If you, don't feel safe. So that's why it's so important that when people come to an SBG or they come to our gym, that we have a, a place where they can feel safe on the mat because they're literally putting themselves in a position where the other person could break their arm or choke them unconscious or who knows what. And if they don't feel safe, they're not going to be willing to put themselves in that spot. If they do feel safe, then they're going to be willing. Not only are they going to be willing to put themselves in that spot, but they're going to do it over and over again and actually start to enjoy it and get yeah. good. And that's how you get good. Right. And I, and I think, 
you know, you can do the exact same thing with social interactions and with communication. And just like with the gym, when we have somebody come in like that, we don't just throw them in and have them come five days a week and just put them right in the middle of a makes martial arts MMA comp team practice where they're getting <laughs> beat up, but you build them up step by step over a period of time. And so, and you could do the same thing. Like you don't have to go out and all of a sudden have some massive conversation with your hairdresser. You just have to be able to walk around and just, just begin start the process of communicating with strangers, you know, and yeah. being able to be able to read those social cues. And I think that'll make a big difference for sure. Cool. Yeah, and then one last thing, uh, when it comes to the self-defense and understanding how to protect myself, my loved ones, where do you draw the line or do you draw the line when it comes to stepping in on behalf of someone else? If we see someone acting erratically or we see someone um, and we're in a, situ in a situation where we can't avoid, we can't get out of there, we can't get away from them. Well, what, what are your thoughts on that? We had a pretty famous case recently. They're calling it the New York uh, subway choke case. Mm -hmm. um, and now this, this guy is being charged with murder for holding a rear naked for too long or, or whatever the case was. I'm not really familiar with all the details yet. And I don't think we're ever going to really know until it goes to trial. Right. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on this? And what, what is our role as a responsible citizen, a good person in, in our community? That's a super hard question. It's a question I've been asked a lot. Uh, it's a question you and I have talked about. We've all talked about this. In a particular case with Jordan Ely and the subway, there's a couple of things there I, I, I want to preface about that particular case. The first, the first issue we have to keep in mind is we're dealing with a district attorney and a city which is releasing violent predators on the street over and over and over again. So you have people who've, who've hurt elderly people, I mean, true violent criminal actors who've beaten up elderly people, who've hit people in the head with hammers, who've pushed people in front of cars, and they're out immediately again. And then you have someone on a subway who sees, my understanding of the story, uh, a homeless person walk in who everybody knows in that area, walk into the subway, begin to act in a threatening manner, talk about how he's not afraid to die, which is usually not a good indication of things, yeah. has an arrest record of like 30 or 40 previous arrests, many for violence. He'd, he'd broken the, the eye socket of an elderly woman. He'd punched another man. So this is somebody who is not only capable of violence, but who, who's been convicted of it. And you had a group of not just one man, but I believe it was four who came to the conclusion that this guy was a threat in a tube, a subway tube, where everybody is kind of stuck with this guy. And they grabbed him and they restrained him until the next stop when the police could come and take him away. Everything about that tells me that those guys were good Samaritans. Those were people who were concerned not just about themselves, but about everybody else on the train. And that's what little I know about the case is backed up by the fact that there were multiple people inside that train who called 911. There were, yeah. that, that guy bothered enough people on that train that he'd scared enough people that they were calling the police while this was happening. And so what I don't want to do is I don't want to live in a world where guys who do that who have no criminal record, who, who've never hurt anybody in their life, but who step forward to try and protect other people and wind up restraining somebody who's known to have physically assaulted elderly people, whether they, the guys who engaged in that knew that or not, we know it. And we know who this guy was. And I suspect that many of the people in the subway might know it because they see these same people every day yeah. because the system just releases them back into the population over and over again. I don't want to live in a world where those are the guys that are going to be prosecuted and everybody else just gets put back on the street because then we're going to be in a world that's surrounded by predators and everybody's going to be afraid to step in. And the only time they're ever going to step in is if it's a direct assault to them personally or maybe their child or their wife. But, oh, he's punching an old lady in the face. Well, I don't want Alvin Bragg to put me in jail for three weeks because I'm white. And that, that's where we're at right now. That's what's happening. Right. And I also tell you that this would have never happened if the Marine who, who was restraining him was black. Right. He, he would have been given an award at this point. Yeah. So, so we've got a big problem in this country with that, that that's way more concerning to me than 
than than just the specifics of that case. I'll be watch, watching that very carefully. But if it turns out that the way I've articulated the facts uh, and what they seem to be are true, and he's still convicted, then I think it's going to be a really dangerous thing. And I I don't know what am I going to tell my son or someone else I care about if they ask me, hey, dad, I'm in a situation, I'm riding TriMet and some elderly guy looks like he's about to bash this elder, or this some violent homeless person looks like he's a, about to bash this elderly woman in the face. What do I do? Do I intervene or do I just get off the train and let it happen? There's no police around. What do I do? Yeah. I would love my answer to be, well, you do what you need to do to protect the innocent people. Right. Yeah. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. But um, I'm afraid that's not where we're at as a country right now. And so yeah. I don't know. I think we need to really pay attention to our elections. Yeah, for sure. I think it's unfortunate. And I think it's about having those difficult conversations, too, where we have to be able to just have conversations about things like violence and be honest with the problem. This is how violence works. It's not as simple. I think there was a an, an issue quite a few years ago, but I believe it was a senator who said something about, have you ever considered just asking them to stop? when speaking about victims of rape or whatever the case was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure they did think about that. You know, I'm pretty sure that did cross their mind, you know, when they were fighting for their life. So I think part of the problem too, is we have people who have no understanding of how violence works and how quickly things can go really bad. Yeah. And, and they're making policies and dictating policy to the rest of us. And we're forced to work within the confines of that or possibly face jail time. Mm Mm-hmm. And what you have, jail time. Absolutely. And what you have going on right now in Portland, in San Francisco, in Seattle, in New York City, in a lot of places, um, is you have violent, homeless, and drug addicts. Some some cases they're mentally ill. And of course, most mentally ill people aren't violent, but a lot of the people who are living on the street because they refuse to get help or take their medication can be. Mm-hmm. And they just get released over and over again. And yeah. we have a guy here in, in Portland that everybody in the neighborhood knows who he is because he's assaulted everybody. He hit a, uh, the, the people who work across the street from us. He hit the gardener one day across the street in the back of the head with a pipe. He's gone after the women who work in the store across the street. He came after me once. He came after my brother once. We've pepper sprayed him a couple of times. Um, we've, we've dealt with him a few times and then he'll run off, but that's just because were big men and if it was yeah. my wife or it was a smaller woman or if it was somebody he thinks he can take on he'll come after and he will for sure assault them everybody in the city knows who he is the police here are totally overwhelmed so they're going from 911 call to 911 call because they don't have but a third of the of the staff that they need and they don't have any backing by the city council or the feckless mayor that we have and so when they do manage to get here they don't want to arrest him because their experiences, if they arrest him, the district attorney or the judge or wh- whoever made the decision in a particular case, they all seem to be guilty of it, releases them right back onto the street. So how many times does that have to happen before they don't want to go through all the paperwork and the process of arresting him because he's, nothing's going to happen to him anyway? Yeah. And that sounds like very much what happened with this guy in New York with like multiple arrests for violent assaults. And yet he's just released. So the other thing we have to have a conversation about, I think, is what do we do with people like that? What do we do with people who have a history of violent assault, who don't want to go to a halfway house, who don't want to take their medication, who are clearly a a danger to themselves and someone else? Do we want to just let those people live in tents out on the sidewalk and assault anybody that walks by? Is that the world that we want to create? I mean, we, ultimately, we have to have a place where we can take these people so that they can get help, but also just to protect the community. And none yeah. of that is happening right now. None of that is. And in fact, it's the proposals I see are going the opposite direction where they want to pass legislation making it impossible to even make these people move. So if they if they start squatting out front the business, it'll, I'll be in a position where there's actually nothing I can do about it. And oh, so, wow. you know, I don't know. That's, that's kind of a off topic of the book, but in a way it's just such a, seems like such a bad time right now when it comes to these kind of things. In a way it's a good time for the book because it's prescient, but in another yeah. way it's, it's, uh, it's hard to be optimistic about 
the next couple of years. Yeah, definitely. I can see that. I feel like uh, I've always felt this way that parole boards, judges, um, if they release somebody or, or they parole someone, um, I think they should put their money where their mouth is. If you think this sex offender is safe to be on the street, then you should put him in the room down the hall from your kids. Mm -hmm. And if you think this murderer, you think she's never going to do it again. Okay. Well, you've got a spare bedroom in your house. Let her stay there. Mm -hmm. And we'll give it like three years. If three years and still, you know, on the straight and narrow, then let them go. But I feel like if there was more skin in the game um, from that side of the house, that, things would be a little different in rulings and sentencings and, and things of that nature, you know, that folks would realize there are, there are consequences. And the problem is that the neighborhood that bears the consequence, the area of the community that bears the consequence is not the same. Not where the, the judge, judge lives. Yeah. The judge, the parole board, it's not the same. And so there's no consequence. There's no real time. Again, we're back to, People who aren't honest with the problem, aren't honest about what violence looks like, they haven't seen it mm -hmm. or they don't see it acted out in front of them on their neighbors or on their their own children or on themselves. And so it's it's meaningless to them. Mm -hmm. And so a eight year old kid getting shot and killed or injured pretty badly in Chicago means nothing to the councilman or the mayor who lives in a gated community. Yep. You know, where that's that's never going to happen. If it does happen, it's domestic. It's a domestic violent mm -hmm. situation. It's not um, a gang gang warfare issue or or just violence, you know, male versus male violence, mm -hmm. you know. So I could think agree the more, more. Yeah, I think the more we talk about this, the more we get this book out here, I think the more it's going to do a, a good job of leading people into difficult conversations and having them be realistic about what this is, what we're really talking about. I so, hope so. I hope so. Yeah, I've enjoyed the book, man. And I've recommended it to everybody. I, there's a whole bunch of people. I should I should get like a 2% commission or something. <laughs> <for sales. laughs> definitely. I'll get you an affiliate code. Yeah, that would definitely work. But uh, definitely, man, I appreciate the book. I appreciate um, all the effort you put into putting this out here and having these conversations. I know, it, you know, like you said, um, jokingly, you haven't been canceled yet, but it's definitely put you on the target list for quite a few people who don't want to take the time to have that conversation and don't want to take the time to listen and really hear what's being said and, and address it point by point. They just want to just go off the rails and, um, and not have this conversation. So I appreciate your effort in pursuing the truth and, and sticking to it and sticking to the, the message and trying to get it out there. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. I appreciate all your help and, uh, and people who read the book will see that you, you, had a big influence on a lot of what's written in there in a positive way too. So I appreciate that a lot. Cool, man. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah.